You're listening to The Valley Current. So let's let's start over again if we can, and we'll just it, treat the other part as throat clearing. So welcome into The Valley Current. Bob, you look great. You got Will Rogers behind you. You're in a new place, which is nice. You got a ranch. We'll right. leave out all the details, but you got some great artwork behind you and in front of you, and you're at your desk at your ranch. Yes. And, and, and I'm just curious, you know, when you look back in your career, it spans, I think it spans almost soon 60 years, I want to yes. say. Right? Yes, it, yeah, I would say, yes, next year will be 60 years. Right. And so you came out to California, and you were, unfortunately, had a technical glitch at my end. And I think you were telling me that you came out from Columbia with yeah. the person who became your first wife. Yeah, my and girlfriend. Her name was yeah. Lois. I was trying to yes. remember her last name. Prentice, Lois Prentice. And what, she's whatever. still alive. She's still alive, and she uh, practice. She doesn't practice, but she lives in Sausalito. Right, but she took a phone call from Mel Bell. She took a phone call from a friend of mine, and yeah. never told me about it, and went in to interview with Mel and got a job. And um, then six months later, my friend called me and I went in and that's when Mel and I were talking. And that's when he said, you know, he wanted to hire me. And I said, I don't know. And uh, so he said, well, why don't we do a trial period of uh, uh, 30 days? And after 30 days, we'll each decide if we want to proceed. Right. And interestingly enough, the 30 days passed and we never thought about it. And it, it grew into seven years. That's amazing. But what was your first reaction to him? Because my first reaction to him was like, this guy's a great lawyer. When I met him, I was like, he's a great lawyer, but man, he doesn't look like a great lawyer. He just oh, he looks I, like a really chubby guy is what, the way I remember. That was perhaps when he was chubby. But when I went in there, uh, he was 58 years old. Okay. And he, yeah, as a matter of fact, the first time I ever saw him was at a debate he had with Mark Wayne. Mark Wayne was an advocate of the conspiracy theory of the death of Kennedy. Right, right, and, right. Uh, yeah, and Mel was an advocate for the Warren Report, and 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 uh, that's when I first met him. And uh, there's another story I could go into with that, because uh, uh, as to the Warren Report, you know, one time, I can tell you this, one time I was sitting around with him at night, and we were drinking, he and I, and we were drinking bourbon. And I said, hey, Mel, you know, you represented jack ruby right and you had private times with jack ruby right Did jack ruby ever talk to you about what happened who hired you was it the mafia how did ruby get well right. i do know this and my first day there uh, downstairs in the basement of the library i found a check and it was a check from earl ruby to mel belli to right. represent his brother jack ten thousand dollars Insufficient funds. It's <laughs> insufficient. But Mel, Mel didn't want a fee. He didn't care about a fee. He just wanted to get the publicity. I wish right. you had the check. So in any event, I um, I said to him, Mel, you know, what do you think really happened? And he said to me, I I you know I don't want to talk about it. I said, Yes, you want to talk about it because I want to know. This is the biggest event of the 20th right. century. Right. And you were there, Mel. What did Jack ever tell you? He says, I just don't want to talk about it. And um, but I do know, I do know with respect to that, that uh, Mel was very close friends with a lawyer in Tampa, Florida named Frank Regano. Frank Regano wrote a book in, in the last 20 years. He's dead now. But it was called Mob Lawyer, Mob Lawyer. So, you know, okay. there was this connection. But in any event, so then I, I went to work for Mel. And uh, for the first uh, year or so, six months, he gave me a lot of criminal stuff. I did a lot of criminal appeals, uh, death, death cases before the Supreme Court, uh, death, death uh, penalty appeals, and um, uh, wrongful, I, I mean, uh, uh, felony murder cases, a variety of interesting cases. So I started out, the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing was criminal uh, defense work. In fact, uh, when we were doing that, that's when he said to me, you know, Bob, uh, the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court and the California Supreme Court are coming down with these great decisions. And he said, let's write about it. And that's what he said to me. We'll do, write the most important 50 cases. And I did that. And then he said, five you know, zero, five zero. Five zero. And right. then he said, let's turn it into one zero zero. 
And well, hold I, on, I, hold I, on, Bob, hold on, because you're saying you're talking so fast. There's so much here. There's so much rich material here. <laughs> I'm going to put up on the screen Frank Regano's Regano's oh. book, which is Mob Lawyer. This is yeah. the book, right? Yeah. How did you get it so fast? But, yeah. Well, because I've got the power of the internet. It's amazing what you can do if you know how to use it. It's just a very powerful tool. But I've yeah, got. Yeah. Well, there he is. There he is. For, uh, Bob Lawyer. Uh, Regano was on Charlie Rose show. I never saw these pictures. Yeah. Yeah. This is the black and white of him, right? Right here. Yeah. This is the yeah. Black and, and white this, of him. This is so interesting because he became a good friend of Mel's, and therefore I knew all about him. And um, this, you know, the story is. And somebody wrote about this, uh, a name, uh, I'll think of the guy's name later, but they wrote it. But uh, it was, the suggestion was that Mel was chosen by the mafia to represent uh, or, uh, Jack Ruby uh, because they knew that uh, he would just be a great publicity figure and he really would, didn't care about the facts and so forth. And so I don't know. I don't really know, except that Mel never wanted to talk about it. And it was a year before I went to work for him. The trial of Jack Ruby was in uh, uh, 1964. I went in 65. Right. And right. what, what uh, Mel did, his defense, and I said to him, well, you know, it was the, his defense was that uh, Jack Ruby, when he shot Lee Harvey Oswald, that Jack was having a psychomotor epileptic fit, whatever the hell that sounds is. Sounds like the Twinkie defense. Uh, it's almost yeah, as bad yeah, as the yeah. Twinkie okay. defense. Yeah. Psychomotor epileptic fit. No one knew what that was. And he brought in all these uh, would-be experts, and, and the experts uh, uh, testified as to that. And uh, um, anyway, of course, he lost. How could you win that case when Jack would be shot? Uh, Oswald in front of the whole world. Yeah, the whole world. I mean, it was the yeah. whole world, right? Yeah. I mean, so it was anyway, the whole world. I digressed a bit, but I'm going to be digressing because I'll tell you, as I think about all this, I'll tell you what Mel thought about expert witnesses. I, as I say, he introduced expert witnesses there. But in general, he told this story. He said he went to, uh, oh, great picture of Mel. Yeah, I thought we should at least get his face up here because yeah. you've, got, you've got the look and, you know, he was he was an amazing guy. He was a very brilliant lawyer. I mean, he, he was, was a really brilliant a brilliant lawyer. lawyer. Yeah, I see one picture I have in my office. That that picture I have in my office. That was a painting of him, and um, some of these other ones. Uh, but these were all when, when he was relatively young. Uh, yeah, I mean, I remember meeting him when he looked more like this. When he looked more like this chubbier version well he later figured out life. he must have gone up to 300 pounds but he never lost his hair and yes. he said, Susan, yes did you see the thing? Right. he never right. lost yeah. his hair right and uh uh you know when when i asked him about expert witnesses he said i'll give you an example a story about expert witnesses i went to this guy who was an expert witness witness in uh medical uh malpractice cases so Mel went to him and he told the doctor the facts in the case. Right. And the doc doctor listened to it. He said, Mel, that is 100% clear cut malpractice. Yes. Mel said, well, wait a minute, doc, you don't get it. I represent the doctor. Yes. I represent the doctor. And the doctor quickly said, Mel, that's what they're going to say. But now let me tell you what we're going to say. Mm -hmm. Expert right, witness. right. <laughs> so in any event, um, yeah, great pictures of Mel. I don't know who that is in the corner. That's, I, you know, something, this one here at the corner says Mel Belli, but he sure doesn't look like Mel Belli. The other one's all. Oh, this, this one guy. right here. Yeah. This, yeah. This, this looks like a different guy, maybe has the same name. Yeah, and just well, happens to have his picture up there. No, right? because his middle initial, well, yeah, the middle initial is different. See. C, yeah. but C, C was Mel's father and son. C stood for, in Mel's case, Caesar, but Mel was Melvin Moron, not Moron, idiot. Right. Moron was the family name, Belli. Right. Here's the Zodiac, the Zodiac. And then he did, and then he did a book, right? Didn't he do this book about the Jack Ruby case? Oh, yes. He called, his book was called Dallas Justice. Yeah, Dallas Justice, right. 
Yeah, and it was an attack on uh, J- on Dallas and uh, how he was treated there. Uh, is that? Oh, that's it. That's now with the book there. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's him with yeah. the book there. Yeah, yeah. Dallas, so I'm yes, kind of yes. curious. Did you? Did you? When you were working with him, did you get a sense that he would take any kind of case if the client was willing to make it interesting for him financially, or if there was publicity? In other words, how did he judge? whether he would take a case or not. What did you see well, back then? Well, as you know, just generally in the practice of law, case selection is the most important thing. Okay. In my practice, case selection has to do with a lot of other elements. In his case, case selection had to do with how much publicity could he get? How many headlines? How many stories? How many radio or television shows? That's what... Or, or was this person uh, somebody... Uh, Famous. I mean, some of the ones, for example, that I personally represented, like, um, um, God, I just don't understand. The guy that jumped in the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah, Evil Knievel. Evil Knievel, yeah. And another guy I had spent a lot of time with was Mickey Cohn, uh, who was a, uh, a criminal, but a tax evasion guy, and who one time Mel brought before the ABA as a guest speaker on tax law, Mickey Cohn. Um, and uh, then, uh, I, in fact, I, I went to see Mickey Cohn in Soledad Prison when he was there. Uh, but in any event, um, Jimmy Baker, whoever Mel could get. Um, Angela Davis. Angela Davis, as, and, and get some publicity from it. And the, the clients he always claimed that were his, like Zaza Gabor and these people, they weren't really, Errol Flynn, they weren't clients in the sense of doing cases for them. They were hang around, people, people that hung around with him and that sort of thing. Right. Errol Flynn in particular, Errol Flynn was a good friend and they traveled around Europe together. And um, I then later traveled around Europe with Mel, taking trains and staying in the best hotels. And... Um, being uh, having the experience of doing what he did with Errol Flynn, and I'll tell you an Errol Flynn story that I brought that up. Um, one time, Mel and I were outside or in Tijuana, Mexico, right? And we stopped at a little uh, hut or a little uh, shanty out there, and Mel brought me over, and he said, "This is where I used to, he used to go with Flynn." with Errol Flynn. And he showed me, we went underneath, in the dirt, underneath the floor of this garbage house. And there was a prostitute, I forgot her name, who was upstairs. And right. Flynn would go there and listen to her upstairs, screwing some guy. I mean, uh, you would think Errol Flynn uh, could have had any anyone, anyone. anyone in the world. So what do you make of that? Was Errol, was, Errol, was Errol Flynn a bit of a voyeur? Is that your point? I think so. He was a bit of a and voyeur, I think, right? I think, I think, yes. And I think Mel was. And Mel had some more stories about Flynn in Europe and with prostitutes there. Right. Uh, and Flynn had died early and had a, a, sad, uh, a, a sad life. Uh, but uh, Mel, you know, Mel was doing something. One time, I don't think I ever told you this, Susan. One time we were in New York, and Mel took me with him to the Algonquin Hotel, which was an arty kind of hotel. And we went up, I don't know, the fifth or sixth floor or something. We walked down the hall together, and we went outside of a room and just stood there in silence. So Mel obviously had had some experience Ah, in that room. ah, I don't know what it was, ah, but ah, it was so, you know, it was... was, um, Classic. Classic. Oh, yeah. Writers and kind of offbeat intellectuals. intellectuals. Yeah. yeah, it was in the theater Beat district. Parts. So it's, yeah. I may even still be there, the Algonquin Hotel. Is, but anyway, I I can uh, give you a million Belli stories. Well, you uh, got it. I mean, we got it. We, we're not going to get them all down, certainly today, but we got to uh-huh. get them down because this is the first part of the trilogy. The first this part is the first of the trilogy. Part of this the is the trilogy. first part. And wait, wait, it gets better. Watch this. Just take a second and watch this because weaving in this kind of documentary material right on the screen of the Broadway show is so powerful. Just uh-huh. spend a minute. Spend a minute on this idea. I just came up with this idea. Okay. Take a look at this idea and you tell me if it plays, if the internet 
doesn't screw us up here. Just stay with this for a second. Okay. Oh, Cronkite. Waited 45 minutes today to keep a rendezvous with San Francisco's mm -hmm. Zodiac killer of five persons. The man who made the appointment never showed up. The meeting was arranged this morning when a caller, identifying himself as Sam, reached Bella on a KGO TV talk show. He said he was the Zodiac killer and needed help. Here's how it looked and sounded. Jim Dunbar. Yeah, it's Jim Dunbar. Tell us what's going on in, in Sam right now, Sam. Please. I have. Uh, Okay, the reason I wanted to show you that is because there's powerful historical information that's now on video that changes the game of how you do a Broadway play. Or even, hold on, I get rid of this that's playing. Even as you, hold on a second, let me just get this. Hold on a second. This is a different, different thing that got in the way here, but let me just. <laughs> say, unfortunately, I'm not perfect at manipulating these computers. <laughs> I got actually four computers running at the same time. You'll love this. Because you got to, like, queue up the stuff that needs to be queued up. And we don't script this at all, so it's real life. But looking at that, did that take you back? Because you were a yeah. member of his firm back then, oh, yeah. weren't you? Yes, I was definitely in the firm then. That particular day, when he was uh, on, that's Jim Dunbar, yes. ABC News. Yes. And that's in a morning show. And when he was on that show, I happened to be in Alaska. We were representing, I could get in that another time. We were representing Indians up there, but in any Eskimos. But in any event, I didn't see it, but I saw it later. And of course, they made a movie, Zodiac, yes. about it. And uh, he's played by, uh, I forget the guy's name, there's a famous uh, author, that uh, actor who played him. But yeah. Oh, and in the movie, it's hilarious. I mean, Mel chasing after trying to meet with the Zodiac, and uh, and Mel loved it. Now he was the Zodiac wasn't a client, but he was uh, somebody's also seeking publicity. So a great opportunity for two publicity seekers to come together, and um, uh, yeah, they, they. So as I say, they made a whole movie. Um, and, and you know what's interesting, Jack? Uh, there were actually three movies that I've seen about Mel Belli. That's one, Zodiac. Another one is the Ro Rolling Stones movie of Gimme Shelter. Yes. Yeah, yes. Gimme. And, and that was the Altamont concert that we arranged. And we arranged to have the Hells Angels be the protectors and, and the, guardian, the guards there. And um, that was Mel's idea. And that was Mel's idea. It, and turn, it, turn, it turned out to go badly, right? Didn't that it turn was out terrible. to go badly? That guy, they killed a guy. Yes. They killed a guy right up on stage. 
And it was my job there to clean up the mess with the Bar Association, with the wrongful death case that was filed. And Mel hotwired a and, van. And yeah, Mel, Mel hotwired a truck to get up there. During the and, yeah, it, and, and the bar, I mean, it, there was so many problems in connection with that. Well, anyway, that's one movie. This is a quick synopsis number. The wait, wait, wait! Don't movie. don't leave don't leave that movie yet, Bob. Bob because I want I want you to look at this because this is what the movie business <laughs> this is what the movie business does. And it's worth looking at it. Hang on just a second. You tell me what you think of this. That's the Dunbar one. Is there something I can call you that's a little less ominous? Sam. Sam. That's the actor. We can meet Sam and talk about this. <laughs> that was the famous meeting. Yeah, the unit go to the Fairmont Hotel. Sam. Yes. Do you think you need medical care? <laughs> medical. Do you have health problems? I'm sick. I have headaches. Headaches? I have headaches too, but a chiropractor stopped them a week ago. <laughs> I think I can help you. Hey, that's true. <laughs> Mel, that, that's an actor, by the way. But Mel did yeah. have headaches. And it was a fella named Ted Freigart, who was a chiropractor, that allegedly, at least, uh, yeah. uh, cured him of his headaches, or at least temporarily. These calls. It's a long, difficult, so, and ineffective with these short calls. I don't know who that is. Sam? <laughs> We're not tracing these calls. You have my word. So that's one movie. Sam, you need to tell me what your problem is. I don't Okay, the second movie is Alma, Skimmy Shelter, about the uh, Big Stones. Yeah, and, 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 and Bob, what I, what I was trying... Rolling I, Stones people. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, oh, gonna... this was a great one, line in that one. Goes on and on, and he's telling people that um, the, the prospective places, one was Sears Point up in Marin, and then we moved it to Altamont. And um, he's saying that the, the Stones are, they have to do this, and all this, the guy says they're out paying. So anyway, the guy says, I don't want the guy who had the you know, facility, the venue. I don't want Mick Jagger coming to my place, and I don't want Mick Jagger doing this and all this stuff. So when it's, he's finished with that call, he looks up to all of us, and he says, who is this fellow Mick Jagger? He didn't even know who the hell Mick Jagger was. Right. And he's doing the concert. It was hilarious. Uh, and so that's the second movie. And the third movie was one called Breakout, Robert Duvall and um, Charles, uh, Charles Bronson in that movie. And that was a case that I had, a matter that I helped him with. Uh, we had a guy, Joel Ka Kaplan, who was a prisoner in a prison in Mexico City. And we attempted several times to get him out. And finally, we were successful in getting him out. And my job was uh, getting, yeah, them, getting, getting them, getting them, breaking him out, breaking him out, yeah. breaking him out. Yeah, breaking him out. And I got the money, and we hired a guy. And this was in the movie with a helicopter who painted the helicopter. It was blue and white. It was the color of the of Mexican Attorney General's office. And we said it, they, he, guy said this, the attorney general coming to the prison and he landed in the courtyard and all the guards, all the guards in the prison were saluting the attorney general while Joel Kaplan and his whore, the prostitute girlfriend, walked out, got in the helicopter and escaped. That is in a movie and uh, there's a lot more to it, I can tell you. In the well, time, well hold, on, hold on a second because you, you've got so much information and it's so <laughs> valuable. Just spend a minute on this. Oh, there you go, in that movie. Francisco. Uh, I, I'm talking for the Rolling Stones. That's exactly it. Uh, the, their managers and their principals here. <laughs> I've just heard that uh, <laughs> you've offered them your speedway up there for their performance on Saturday. Is that right? That is correct. Well, this is an open phone, so we can all talk on it. What I'm trying to find out is uh, what we can do to okay. do this. For the last 36 hours, I've stood my organization on its ear, Mr. Belli. 
You see, I don't know anything about this. I'm just coming in late. And I'm trying to straighten something out. So you tell me exactly what it is without that. Uh, yeah. My first area of policy concern. I do not want this gesture on the part of Mr. Jagger. <laughs> Jagger. It cost me Jagger. five cents. <laughs> if a blade of grass is torn down, they are going to build it up again. <laughs> you know, I was involved <laughs> in Woodstock. I re have represented rock groups, and I've been involved both as an attorney and as an executive with festivals. No matter what anybody tells you, they're a pain in the ass. There's Don't no turn me into a proctologist. Just tell me what I can do here. Is that funny? So that brings us down to this. Uh, I'll call one of the judges right now. Is that your only chance of forcing these people to do it? Now, don't scare off uh, these people. If I were advising them, I'd tell them to hide out. <laughs> anyway, I thought you'd I thought you'd enjoy seeing that because. Oh, yeah. The benefit of actually blending in some of the video, even on this podcast for the audio, because the video is not going to be seen, but it can be heard, is that you really do get the flavor of what this guy was like and who you were learning from. You were learning from a trial lawyer who was also a good business negotiator. And you're both. You're both, Bob. Right. That's my point. I had a great mentor, and he took to me as a mentee, and he spent a great deal of time with me, and he and I traveled all over the world together, and it was a great introduction and background for what I do now, or have done since then. And uh, But you must he, have seen him, you must have seen him transform himself from what you might call a local San Francisco lawyer to uh, a national figure, to a yes, national and, figure. Yes, and the key to it was the Ruby case. Yes. Prior to the Ruby case, he had a reputation in the Bay Area as a great a personal injury lawyer. A great he, flamboyant, a great flamboyant personal injury yes, lawyer. Yes, and he introduced the notion of demonstrative evidence using real evidence in the courtroom. And the second thing was the adequate award, that is to say, to get enough money for these people. Uh, so, uh, and he had a wonderful piece of demonstrative evidence. He called it Elmer. It was a skeleton. I have it now in my, in my San Francisco office. Yes. yes. I went, when he died, and the bankruptcy trustee had a sale of everything. Oh, by the way, this desk, this desk I'm sitting at was one of his desks. Oh, nice. The desk in my uh, office nice. in, in my um, um, Montecito is one that has is one of this. I essentially bought everything at the auction. Whenever they said that this, I put my hand up, and I have all of the stuff that uh, that he had, um, uh, and including I at one point I even had his clothes, but I gave the clothes away. Yes. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Uh, Yes, I, uh, I, I learned a great deal from him. And the thing about him was he could be very serious. He could be very serious and very knowledgeable and a great trial lawyer. And then he could be a prankster. He was a, a, a practical joker. Right. That was, you know, we, we'd walk down the street to go to lunch and some a homeless person would be lying on the ground and he'd say to me, that's one of my former partners. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, and, 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 and Susan, Susan reminds me every time we were in an airport, 
uh, my job was to go to the phone and page Melvin Belli. So the operators say, Melvin Belli, Melvin Belli. For and adver and all the advertising, 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 guerrilla marketing. Right, and, marketing. And, and, and Las Vegas, uh, we did it all the time. I went and, and paged Melvin fancy Bell. Hotels, yeah, yeah, fancy hotels, yeah. Oh, that's so, funny. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I mean, he just, he Tell just. when you got on the airplane once. Oh, first Susan, first Susan, of course, he always flew first class. So yes. uh, one time I was with him, and we couldn't get a seat. This was flying back from Las Vegas to, to San Francisco. We couldn't get a seat, except in coach. And he didn't want to do it, but we sat in coach. So we're sitting there in coach. And the pilot comes on the intercom and he says, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very big day for us. We have the celebrity, the famous trial lawyer, Melvin Belli, and he's sitting in coach and he didn't want anyone to see him in coach. <laughs> <laughs> this is only time in coach. Oh, that's good. That's really that good. Was great. Oh my God. I mean, and oh, here's a, a thing he did that was very funny. You know, in San Francisco, the big social event of the year is the opening of the opera, right. black tie, white right. tie. Yes. So he and his partner, Lou Ash, went, and they took Art Jackson, who was our black janitor, and we took the janitor, and Mel dressed him up with a tuxedo and white tie. Tails. And, and tail, tails and a big red sash yes. across his chest. Yes. And he introduced him at the opera as the attorney general of Zambia. <laughs> and all these, all these socialites are coming over. And Mel says, I want you to meet the attorney general. And people were just so excited. And then, and so one socialite looks at this black face, probably the only black face in the place. And he says to him, have you ever heard of Willie Mays? <laughs> you know, make the conversation, yes. right? Yes. So, so Jackson says, hey, hey, say hey, Willie. He, ended up and he, blew, he blew the whole thing. Oh, that's funny. That's really funny. <laughs> that was funny. so great because there's these pompous people, you know, we came over to shake hands. And again, he was the only uh, black person at the opera. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, so I mean, he was just joking all the time. Yeah. Oh, I, here's one more. I'll just tell you one more joke. Yeah. Uh, a new federal judge uh, was appointed in oh. San Diego, yeah. brand new to the bench. Okay. And um, Mel knew him. I think his name was Endicott or something like that. In any event, Mel wrote him a letter. And he said, how did the president pick a stupid son of a bitch like you? How could you ever do justice? You are a useless fool. And he copied our, our so-called partner in San Diego, uh, Bill Reed. So Bill Reed gets this thing and he panics and he runs over to the courthouse to see the new judge. And he says, judge, I'm sorry. I didn't know anything about this. And the judge doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. And he shows him the letter and the judge originally got it. Mel never sent the original. He only sent the copy to Bill Reed who would panic and have a, a, a heart attack there. And, and the judge thought it was pretty funny. It was that kind of stuff. Always fooling around. Always coming so up. So the with, only letter that went was the, the only letter that went was the copy. Yeah. Right. The original never went. Right. Right. So he he was just a practical joker. Total he was just a big practical, practical joker. joker. And yes. and you know I think the comedy <laughs> part of practicing law, which we all know is pretty important, it does lead to some creativity. And he was very creative. Yeah. extremely creative you know and and uh, he was the only lawyer who practiced law around the country everyone else at that time if you were admitted in california you practiced in california right. and so forth but he went everywhere he associated local council but he tried cases in, 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 uh, in probably every in state and then yes and then he even went to germany where he did court martial cases he went to uh, vietnam several times where he tried court martial cases. And uh, we actually set up a little office, believe it or not, in Germany. It was Belli, Bailey, F. Lee Bailey. Yes. And, Gar and, and, and uh, Bellin. Bellin was an uh, American lawyer who practiced there. But the other guy he was friendly with at that time, I was just getting it mixed up, was uh, uh, a garrison, uh, the, the, attorney, the uh, district attorney in... Um, New Orleans, who had the movie, there was a movie, J, I think it's JFK. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. And Garrison's in that. Um, so, yeah, a lot of funny stuff.
Well, you you have had a lot of uh, good stuff flowing towards you as a result of what you saw with him because you're a much more refined version. You've got a national practice. You built a national practice. You built a national practice from the get-go, right? Literally from the get-go. Well, yes. I I left Mel in 1972, and I took with me half of the lawyers, and I opened up my office around the corner from him. I was on Jackson Street right off of Montgomery. He was on Montgomery. And uh, I had an old brick building similar to his old brick building. And uh, I took with me a number of, well, a number of clients. I left because at that time, I was, through my people, we were producing half the money, half the fees, yeah. and yeah. I was getting 10% of the profit. So yeah. I left. And uh, so then Mel called every one of those clients that I had uh, taken with me and um, said, uh, you don't want to uh, uh, work with him. They, he, what he said about me was, he was gay, uh, he's gay, and he's also screwing the receptionist. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, come on. Yeah, That's just too funny. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Well, let me ask you let me ask you something. You so far have not done any films, even though to me you're probably in some ways more famous than Mel Bella. No, no built, I have you've not, built I, a much more substantial practice. You've generated much more recovery than he ever generated for anyone. Many, many times. Many times. And I uh, did follow in the tradition of helping the little guy, but we have recovered billions of literally billions yes. of dollars for people. Yes. And uh, we now have um, 150 lawyers in the firm, uh, which is, starting with me. I was the first one, and then now there are but, 150, but 150 very profitable lawyers. The very profits good. per lawyer is probably bigger than Wachtell Rosen in, in New York yes. City. Yes, interestingly enough, and we don't get in the, the American Lawyer magazine of the top 100 because right. they don't do plaintiffs' law right. firms. Right. But the reality is, I, I realized this many years ago, that yes, our partners make more money than those, you know, certainly Wattel, I think is number one. Wattel, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, I'm presently litigating Wattel is among the two firms uh, representing uh, Monsanto and uh, Bayer. Uh, they and our own porter. Um, so yeah, so I, and I, I've been to their office many times recently this past yes. year. Yes. So, so Bob, we have a few minutes. Let me just say, I think this is very exceptional material for a good start of the first of the trilogy that I can see that we can put together. And the, the good reaction we can get from even a select group of people we trust to watch both the audio and the video and to start to see the vision because the vision is is there you can oh, yeah. see the forest for the trees mm-hmm. there's a lot of trees there's a lot of trees that we have to deal with but it's a big forest and there's a lot of material here so i would implore you to please look back on all your old no all your old notebooks all your old photographs pull all that stuff together it's going to be hugely valuable mega valuable going well forward. one thing i learned from him when i was there i kept my calendars and my secretary kept hers she kept track of every incoming and outgoing call that i had okay i kept track of everything i've done and i have every single calendar Good. from 1965 to the present great. time great great so let's end on that you're going to pull a bunch of stuff together i'm going to send you some other topics this was a very rich <laughs> Very spontaneous. I'm so glad you made time today. I appreciate it. Uh, I know you're rushing around. I appreciate well, thank you, you doing for that. accommodating us. Of course. We had to get here. We had to get Yeah, no, you did the right thing. And Will Rogers should feel very good because he's <laughs> witnessed the start of something great here. It's great. So thanks very much. You have All a right. good weekend. So take you care. Day. Susie, you take care too. Thanks for making yeah, this yeah, happen. Yeah. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.